city of Hamburg in Germany, <laughs> and he got street cost there. So someone asked him, ah, do you want to try to work as a, as a model? And he's like, yeah, sure, I can do that. And yeah, two we years later, that. yeah, <laughs> we all know that. Yeah, we all, yeah, I get that. I get that. <laughs> <laughs> and then he reacted like in a way, uh, you know, because like uh, to be a male model is not really a high status profession. So he's like, okay. Mm -hmm. But two years later, he's one of the best paid male models in the whole industry. And he does a, he does a perfume campaign with Peter Lindbergh that makes him very famous. Uh, uh, and if I would show it to you, you would know which campaign it is. And the thing is that he is now like 21. He has gotten used to a certain kind of lifestyle that is completely different from being a car mechanic. And uh, uh, you know, how do you exit from that if you are a model? What are you going to do next? And you are so dependent on your looks and your beauty. And what happened to this guy was that he started to get bald. He was starting to lose his hair. So he could see the drop in front of him. You know? uh, like coming. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I'm going to go back to the countryside of Germany and be a car mechanic. But then he had, a, he had an agent that was uh, saying to him, okay, he was looking at hair problem. And, and um, he said, um, okay, you may have two more years in this industry. And, uh, uh, but we have another problem also, and it is that the perfume campaign that you have done, uh, you are so connected to the brand, so no one else wants to book you on the same level of yours. So we need to rebrand you. Uh, so it would be great if you get together with a famous girlfriend. And uh, the model, he, he goes, he's a little romantic, you know, so he says, like, what about love? Uh, <laughs> and the agent is like, uh, um, yeah, come on, man. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 but and the, the fun part of what the whole story, the fun, tragic part of this thing is that when I pitched this film about the branded couple I did, uh, when I pitched it to, to my generation, to people born in the 70s, all, all, everyone that I pitch it to go, oh, how horrible, you know, what about love? And when I pitch it to people that are millennials, like people born in, yeah, in, in the beginning of this, uh, this millennium, you, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I say, okay, so we have Paul and Yaya, and they are a branded couple, and they just go, aha, uh -huh, okay, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the catch? No, no, they, they, yeah, yeah, they, yeah. So it's a huge difference just in, like, uh, 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 
the generation shift yeah. when it comes to looking at company re relationship as a business model and as something that you use in order to like yeah, position yourself and so on. So I thought that was like, that was probably like, I have to do something about it. That's, that's really funny. Now, Dolly, you're a, a genius. You're so good in this. <laughs> Scene when you are saying like here I'm the captain, but also the intimate conversation between Carl and Abigail in the lifeboat, <laughs> and they're kind of different moves, uh, and you made them very very in a very very beautiful way. Yeah. And I believe like when you when you understand why a character is doing what they are doing, you also get sympathy for them. Yeah. Then you also yeah. feel like okay, yeah. I understand, I understand the setup, I understand why why she's saying what she's saying. And even if she's basically is being someone that is abusing her power, 
position, I like her. Yeah. And uh, um, um, uh, uh, so the, the, yeah, Dolly was uh, uh, when we, when I saw the first uh, improvisation that um, Pauline did with uh, with this, uh, with Dolly in Manila, then uh, uh, yes, here, here she is. Was that a difficult thing for when you had to improvise? When I, was that something you knew you were going to have to do? You know, it's funny because uh, I was doing the scene with Pauline, right? She's the casting director, <laughs> and she was very intimidating, you know, with her chewy tobacco. You know, she was really. I, was <laughs> I can't imagine this person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, all right, I'm the casting director. What are you doing in these parts? is very often long, like over an hour often, where uh, I'm pitching the project. It doesn't matter who you are as an actor. Everybody is treated with the same kind of like the time aspect and, and so on. And then the goal is, you should get this part. Come on now. How do we do it? How do we make you perform in, in, in a way where, how do we make you feel relaxed? How do we make you have fun? How do you make you dare to take risks? Yeah. And uh, it shouldn't be a pressure when you go to a costing because then you are not performing on the highest level. You should yeah. you should be feel to be uh, that you can play around and you, you dare to do things that you maybe wouldn't dare to do. So you, we also can see the, all the different aspects of the actor. Yeah, that's what you, it wasn't until I was on the other side of the table when I was auditioning people that I realized how much power the actors have who come in and audition. Yeah. Really it's like, like, it's like the costing in the starting of the film yeah. often on when it comes to the, uh, the costing sessions with, uh, with fiction films like this. Yeah. Uh, it's, exactly. a, it's a factory, oh, come in and do it. Okay, good yeah. out. So it's important to try to, uh, then you're not bringing out the best. Yeah. Okay. I really felt that with Pauline because normally if you're in a scene, uh, imagine she's the casting director, right? And she's doing the scene with you. So you would imagine that when it's my turn to speak, she would just be watching me act, right? But no, she was still in character as far. Wow. So it really helped a lot. That's amazing. Yeah. Very uh, generous casting director. Was there a scene in this ballet? I, I know any time I've acted in a movie, there's always a scene that scares me. The scene that you're, what are we shooting that? What are we gonna shoot? You know, was there a scene in this that scared you? Yes, the last scene really scared me. I mean, even before going in there, I, I was reading it and I knew it was a very important scene. In fact, I, I had some, you know, I asked Ruben if we could talk about it, how he was going to do it. I already wanted to know how he was going to position the camera and all that because I really wanted it fleshed out. I wanted to plan it very well because I knew it was a very important scene. And, you know, it, if you read the script on paper, it doesn't say anywhere there that Abigail is getting very emotional now while she's picking up the rock. It's not there, but you know, when, when I was reading it, I was imagining that it would be that way. So I was very nervous about that, that last scene. Well, it is amazing. It's phenomenal what you do in that scene. It's like the whole, the stakes, the emotion, everything is in that look on your face. Was that when you were shooting that too, Ruben? I mean, to end the movie on that, I mean, to me, that look says it all, you know, and I don't know if that was a plan or if that was something when you were shooting it, it just happened and you go, oh my God, everybody, don't move, this is really something. Uh, no, but it was something that totally brought to the scene, definitely. I mean, I think that um, uh, me, when we were working with 
that's it. I may didn't realize how exhausting it was for you to uh, emotionally go into uh, that shot when he's walking towards Yaya and and uh, to get the expressions that you had in your face. How how much energy you had to put in. And I took carry that heavy rock. I'll <laughs> <laughs> carry that rock too. Yeah. Wait, you carry your own rock. No, but I was just going, yeah, another take, another take, another take, great. yeah, yeah, it looks great. Let's go again. Yeah, okay, good. Hold the right higher. <laughs> but I definitely had a when we were when we were on set and we were shooting then like but what you look for as a director is of course that you have when you are going above your expectations. Yeah. That, you know, like when you've written something, you're just like, okay, this can be really, really good. And many of the shooting days, you feel like we didn't reach it 100%. Yeah. Uh, and, but the days when you feel like, okay, we reached it, and you feel super satisfied. But the greatest days is when you go home and you have gone beyond what you thought you would be able to get. And I remember these days shooting that, we were going home with a boat. And, the, the joy of going in that with that boat and the sun is going down and we had both this uh, this shot with Dolly and I was immediately taking pictures and sending to all the uh, friends that I have home in Sweden and you can look where we go today and it was the, it was the expression of Dolly's face that was uh, yeah. uh, back there. Oh, it brings the whole movie together. I mean it's really amazing. As I, mean, I don't know how you get the performances in your movies. The force majeure, play, all these, the square, all these films like we sit there, I'm editing a TV show we're on right now, we just sit there talking about your movie, your movies and just go, how did he, how the hell did he get those performances? You know? <laughs> like in this, when the, the capitalist guy, when they're first talking and the, his girlfriend shows him his phone and he goes, well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where you feel, I have seen similar content before, then what I don't like as a director is like that, that I feel that I'm repeating something that we have seen before. So when you start to shoot the scene, where you feel it's very close to be a conventional scene, you have to find the right angle to, to how you approach the directing so you can bring out something unique, something that is maybe uh, new in some way. And it takes time to get to see what that is. So when you start to play it out and you, you try again, and many takes is a way of buying time as a director, that's yeah. one thing, that you maybe have an idea of what, what you want to reach to, but you don't know how to get there. And uh, uh, then take of the take is playing out. And what happens to me is very often that it goes better and better up to take 20. 20? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then it gets worse. <laughs> and it gets like, that happened now. Suddenly the actors are getting a little bit, you know, they don't know what they're saying anymore. And it's some dialogue. Dolly's not in your head, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're just saying the dialogue without like putting any anything behind it. And then you have to uh, push it up, like come on up. And, <laughs> and then when you when they hopefully reach a level above take 20, then uh, what I'd love to do, if, if we have time, then I say, okay, everybody go and have a break for half an hour, or let's say that we have half an hour. And when you get back on set, I say, five takes left, everybody ready? <laughs> and we do a countdown where you're trying to push in a feeling we are playing a football game that is the World Championship Finals. Now we're going to win this together. Four takes left, three takes left. And I started to, with the final silence, I brought the gong to set. A gong? Yeah, a gong. So before we did the last take, we hit the gong. <sighs> Wait, before the take? Yes, yes, yes. 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 And then, then I go like, to say action. So you hit the gong, bong, and then it becomes silent. And then the scene starts, and then one of the actors had a cue to start it. The goal is to create a vibrating present, yeah. a feeling of it's now or never. Because if you do a lot of takes, um, uh, still you want to create the feeling of 
this is the exact right moment that we are saving to the editing that we're going to use the material. I can't understand why we are using this kind of technique otherwise. We, are, we have the possibility to save a unique moment. Then that moment has to be unique. So the goal is to try to create a, like a, a team feeling in the end. I also gathered the whole team behind the camera. So the camera is here looking at the actors. Everybody is watching the actors. <laughs> so like, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's about like give them, give them hundred yeah, yeah, percent attention love. because you know what? Sometimes on set you see someone standing in the background. Yeah, yeah, yeah that that like that's this. True. When someone is trying to make the performance of the yeah, life, that's true. Okay. That's true. So um, he shouts, everybody, drop whatever you're doing. Stop looking at your phones and look at the actors. <laughs> Hey, did you do your homework? 
and she went, uh, yes, what yes? <laughs> <laughs> Well, one thing that I've been done, started to do with uh, the three last films that I've done, Force Mayor of the Square and Fellow Sanders, is to have a lot of audience meetings. And uh, to not ask the audience so many questions, but to sit together with the audience and see like how is their attention there? Are they concentrated? Uh, are they thinking about something else? How are they reacting? Because of course it is like this when you sit and edit, and, and you have seen scenes over and over again. For, for example, the vomiting scene. I've been sitting and, and watching it so many times, so for me it's completely nothing. Like, I don't even, I don't react in it. I don't understand even how someone can think this is uh, something to react to. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, um, I, I, the first time when I'm screening that scene for an audience, then I get, ah, this is what it feels like to watch it for the first time. And there, there, for me, I would say that it's so interesting how rhythm is changing how we're looking at something. So when you have the wrong rhythm in the film, when, when something is dragging out a little bit too long, sometimes I like to drag out the scene, I like to push the scenes, but there's a limit when they actually is not going to help the rest of the film. So you're trying to find the balance between how long the scenes can be and still uh, the film works in, it, in itself in, 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 the, in the, the whole range. And uh, the first version of this film was probably one hour and 20 minutes longer. But it's not many scenes that have disappeared. It's rather the in and the out points of the scenes that it's uh, uh, different. And uh, uh, for me, it's always like, go back to the audience. This movie is made to be watched collectively, together with uh, uh, a lot of different. That changes the rhythm so much. So sitting alone and watching it, I can't really judge the, the rhythm of the film if, it, if it's dynamic or if it's working. But as soon as I go to get with an audience, I say, oh, oh my god, I have to go, I have to go out there. Or, um, uh, and I am a little bit surprised that, that audience screenings have a little bit of a bad reputation in Europe. It's like not being an auteur. You know, then you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you want to sell tickets. No, it's not about that. We are making something that should work in a cinema where a lot of people are watching it together, and it's going to change the rhythm. And uh, uh, so always when I go together with an audience, I understand, ah, the, the, now I, I know that this is working or not working. And it's amazing when you see, like, ah, if I cut out a little earlier in this scene, uh, all of a sudden the scene that comes after becomes re works really, really well, and it didn't work that well before. But I can't, I can't judge it without having an audience sitting and watching it. Um, guys, I think that's it. I think I gotta wrap this up. But um, yeah, I like to end it like that. <laughs> 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 <laughs>